Thank you, Jonathan. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Let's uh, go to God in prayer. And uh, we have been uh, going on a series of understanding the grace of God, which is a Greek word, charis, in the Bible. And uh, we're going uh, book by book right through the New Testament. We started in the Old. And uh, because it's quite a series and we're going book by book, uh, we took a break uh, the last two weeks and just talked about the different series on relationships. And that's probably the style that we will follow. Uh, when we do a long series, we'll take a little break, uh, maybe just one instead of too many, uh, on a different angle altogether, so that we still touch on different topics uh, when the series is slightly longer than what we anticipated. But uh, otherwise, the series will be reasonable length, about maybe six, seven sessions. Uh, but when you study right through the Bible, understanding the grace of God, um, we just follow the Bible as it is, book by book. And sometimes we could combine books together, sometimes we can't. Uh, but let's go to God in prayer as we consider His Word this afternoon. Father, we thank You for Your grace and Your mercy upon our lives. We thank You, Father, that Your Word is all-powerful. By Your Word, You make the heavens and the earth. And this same word we know contain the power of your Holy Spirit. We know, Father, that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, unto joints and marrow, discerning the intents and the thoughts of our heart, O oh Father. And we thank you, Father, that even as we come together in you, that you release upon our lives a fresh, O oh God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. For unless you show unto us, unless you reveal it unto us, we can't see all things clearly. And we thank you, Lord, that it is by your spirit's wisdom and revelation that you cause the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened, that we may know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. We lift the name of Jesus high in our midst afresh, O oh Lord. And we thank you, Father, for Jesus and all that He is, all that He has done. And we ask, O oh God, that this afternoon, as we gather in your name, and through your word, let your voice be heard and let Jesus be glorified afresh and lifted high. We thank you, Father, that your word of truth your word of life continue to give us life. Continue, O oh God, to impart faith. And that you would stretch forth your hand and touch our lives and grant the miracles, O oh God, that confirm your word with signs following. Thank you, Father, for the authority and power of Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, that that name is glorified as we proclaim the word of your gospel of your spirit, and of all that is within your heart. The words that Jesus came to bring, that is established in the life of your church. Glorify yourself afresh, Father. Glorify the name of Jesus. And cause each one of us afresh, O oh God, to worship you again and again. We covenant to always give you all the glory, the worship, and the honor. For all that you do. We thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Praise God. Let's look at the book of uh, Philippians. The book of Philippians. And um, we're now looking at uh, grace, especially in the book of uh, Philippians. And um, Philippians, uh, the word grace, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, occurs only three times. And it occurs um, in verse 2. And uh, grace, it says to you, and peace from God our Father and, our, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It occurs in verse 7. And the translation is an interesting one, which we'll look at afterwards. But I'll read the verse to you. It says, just as it is right for me to think this of you, all because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. 
And then the last time it occurs in terms of the word charis, which is a noun or Greek word for grace, is uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 23. It says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And that's very clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, charis. Now, as we study in this series on uh, charis, we also realize that um, there are other derivations of the word grace, like the noun of the word grace is the word charizomai. And uh, so grace is a, uh, grace is a, a noun, and uh, the verb that is of the word charis is the word charizomai. That's the verb version, and using grace as a verb. And there's no English equivalent, no English translation. How do you translate grace as a verb? I grace you, you know, that's completely no English equivalent. And uh, so it's been translated slightly differently. And uh, it's been translated as freely given or gifted or some sense like that. Trying to imply some sort of impartation. And the word karizomai actually occurs in uh, chapter 1, verse 29. And we read that one says, Therefore, to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. So in verse 29, it has been grace unto you. It has been freely given unto you. That's the word charizomai. And the Bible translates the word granted. But that's the Greek word of the word grace, charizomai. So it could be translated uh, in this manner, for to you, using the word grace as a verb, for to you it has been grace on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. There's a strange little verse there. The other time the word charizomai occurs is in reference to Jesus Christ Himself in chapter 2 verse 9. It says here in chapter 2 verse 9, Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given. Now, the word given is the word charizomai. So, you could translate it that God also has highly exalted him and graced him the name which is above every name. So, to Jesus was given a name above every name by the grace of God. Jesus inherited that. And in a sense, you would have five occurrence of the word charis or its derivation charizomai in the book of Philippians. In studying grace, we all know how good grace is and how wonderful grace is and how grace can change our life, transform our lives. Grace brings the gifts of God to work in our life. Grace brings blessings into our life. Everybody wants grace. Everybody wants to increase in grace, multiply it in grace. And we do know the Bible principles that uh, God gave grace to the humble. Uh, God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. And we know that those things uh, are mentioned in the epistle of Peter. And it's also mentioned in the book of James. And you find that it emphasizes how God gave grace to the humble. And so if we were to ask you a question, how does grace come? It's obvious that grace comes through humility. As we humble ourselves before God, then only does grace come. And uh, then when we, we take that thought further and we ask another question. If grace comes by humility and humbling ourselves before God, what's the greatest humbling process that we can have? After all, the greater the humility I wanted to say the word humiliation, humility involves sometimes humiliation, whatever, or things where we got to humble ourselves before God. The greatest humility that anyone could ever experience, what is that? In the life of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. After all, we know from Genesis to Revelation, who would be the most humble man? 
on the whole face of the earth and in all human life and society. We have to say Jesus Christ. If you are thinking of somebody else, repent. <laughs> Jesus Christ has to be the winner. The most humble. I mean, he humbled himself in the flesh. God emptied himself and came and dwelt among us. And, and the extent of the humbling and the humiliation is in proportion to how much one has given up. And look at Jesus. He has given everything up to come, to live on this earth, die on the cross for us. And Jesus in it is the most humble person on all the whole planet, every generation in all the human race. And then in Jesus' life, since he's the most humble man on, of all the human race, at which point was the greatest exhibition of the humility of Jesus Christ? The cross. The cross, which began from Gethsemane right through to his resurrection by God the Father. So obviously the cross. And uh, that is why it says here in uh, Philippians 2 verse 9, Therefore, because of how much he has humbled himself, God graced him. God raised him up and proclaimed that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Christ. He is Lord. And God has given him a name, graced him a name above every other name. So the cross of Jesus is indeed the most powerful force on earth. The thing about grace in the book of Philippians here is this, that Paul begins to speak of, about, in a very strange manner, of, a, of an area of grace that sometimes we overlook in Christianity. Because when people talk about grace, if you're Old Testament, you think about favor, promotions, good things, which we already touched in this series on grace. But yet, if you want to receive the real maximum effect of grace, you can't avoid the example of Jesus at the cross. The cross is the greatest place where potentially who is the giver of grace. Who is the greatest measure of grace? Jesus. Grace upon grace. He is full of grace because he was full of humility. He humbled himself even in coming here. So the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, full of grace. He was full of grace. All through his life, right to the time he was at the cross. In view of that, how the cross is linked to grace and the fullness of it, we realize that if we want the fullness of grace, we have to understand the cross of Jesus Christ. And what is the cross of Jesus Christ? And Paul seems to link the cross and grace together in the book of Philippians. More stronger and beautifully than any other book. See, each book of the Bible where the grace occurs seems to give a shade of meaning. And in Philippians, Paul links the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul says, if you want what's on the right side, the grace of God, and all that it entails, you must have the cross. You can't have one without the other. That's his message in the book of Philippians. And we see an indication of that right from chapter 1 where he used an expression that looks strange in the Greek translation, but maybe not so much in the English. And here's a verse in verse 7, chapter, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, where Paul says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains, so he's talking about suffering for Jesus, in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Talking about his sufferings for the gospel. He was in chains. He was defending the gospel. He was in prison for the gospel. And he was preaching the gospel. And he was confirming the word of the gospel. And he says, You all 
are partakers with me of grace. He says, in this manner, you all share a part of this same grace. He says, same grace. We are all partaking together, he says. We are all somehow joined together in this grace, partaking it together. That's the translation. It looks like together, we partake of the grace of God, of this grace that he's talking about like uh, people partaking of uh, the same cake or the same food or something, they're sharing something together. But not all translations put that verse in that manner. In that particular verse, there's in the old King James, where they, they were very literal, they, they were not looking at the doctrinal side, they were more thinking of how the English expression was to be poetic and true to its original meaning of Greek at that time. Because at that time, uh, some of the Hebrew understanding was not as deep, but the Greek was reasonably so. And in verse 7, this is the other translation in the, re, uh, in the authorized version of the King James, Old King James. It says that you all are partakers of my grace personalized grace instead of partakers together of grace some of your versions if you have the old king james translate it as partakers of my grace you say hey wait a minute i thought the grace came from the lord jesus christ remember right at the end philippians chapter 4 it says the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you so how come here's my question how come in philippians chapter 1 paul is saying partake you are partakers together with me of my grace. Where the personal grace? What in the world is he talking about? Is there such a thing? Well, to see whether that's really a good translation, look at the Greek, which is the original language. In the Greek, it actually says, in just that phrase, it says, Mutes karitos. Mutes karitos. Every Greek scholar knows that the word mu which is uh, romanized as M-O-U, means of, of me or of mine. Not with me or by me. Not with me or by me. Mu, M-O-U, means of my or from my. Strictly speaking, it should be translated partakers of my grace say wow that's strange there's a doctrinal error isn't it grace comes from the lord jesus christ what in the world is paul talking about there is an aspect where grace is shared there is an aspect where god gives some people the grace for different gifting in a sense like there's a grace to be a prophet, grace to be an evangelist, grace to be an apostle, grace to be a teacher. There's a grace of God. So in a sense, we're trying to explain it from the theological sense, that if you receive a prophet as a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. That would be the grace of the prophet. The reward in receiving the prophet. If you receive a righteous man as a righteous man, by the way, by the, by the way that is an expression from the Bible too, you receive a righteous man's reward. So, the grace that was on the righteous man comes upon you. Although we recognize, although we recognize that all grace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we recognize that. We also recognize that all gifts come from the Holy Spirit and from God. But sometimes the Bible uses the personal pronoun of me or of my to tell us not that it is really from them but that there is something that is shared that the person is experiencing if it's a prophet and the prophet bless you what has happened you've just been blessed by the prophetic grace if it's a righteous man righteous man bless you you've just been blessed by the righteous man's blessing so in that way, there's a personal element without taking away from the fact that that personal element indirectly, directly still came from the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize that. And so without taking away the glory from the Lord, 
without misunderstanding that Paul was trying to, to say that it's him and not God, because we know that's never what he meant. He always says Christ lives through him. And it's the grace of God in his life. And that God gave him the grace to be what he is. Without misunderstanding that, we want to examine why Paul used the personal pronoun in the word grace. Never occur in any other passage. What is he talking about? And if you examine it very carefully, Paul was talking about sharing not just the good things of the kingdom of God, but sharing in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. He said, well, that one I don't want to share. <laughs> Come and share my suffering. Oh no. So you don't want to share. Say, hey Paul, keep your suffering to yourself. Hey, wait a minute. That suffering equals greater grace. So there's something good, not bad. He said, Pastor, prove that point. Although it's in another different book, uh, Colossians, which we will look at the next week. But for now, just look over at Colossians chapter 1. And he talks about suffering uh, for them and filling up the suffering that is in Christ. In verse 24, Philippine, uh, Colossians 1, 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. That's a very strange expression for Paul to say, my sufferings for you. There is an element, just as Christ suffered for us, those who are called by Jesus must suffer in order to bring the same grace to others by default. It just carries down the line. That there is a price that is paid to bring the grace of God to another. The cross doesn't end at Calvary. Now, before we go further, look at Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Didn't he emphasize and re-emphasize this in verse 29? He says, for to you, he says. Now don't forget, he's talking about sharing in his chains and sufferings for Jesus. He says, for to you. Yes, it's a privilege. He put it like a privilege. To you, it has been grace on behalf of Jesus Christ, not only to believe in Him, you will be satisfied. Say, oh, praise God. The grace of God is on us to believe and to receive and to achieve. What did Paul say in verse 29? He says, God give you grace. God grace you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Paul says, suffer for his sake. He says, he, he talks about it as if it's a privilege. Now, I know some of us might not think of the cross as a privilege. We modern Christians do not. Then when he continues in Philippians chapter 2 and talk about the grace that was on Christ, he talks about Christ's suffering in verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because they've been to the cross, God has highly exalted him and graced him with a, with a name above every other name. So he's not trying to point to suffering as a bad thing. He's trying to point to the suffering as the way to the greater glory. The reward that is eternal, both eternal and on this earth, I believe. But he's trying to point to some great glory. That is why to suffer for Jesus is not something bad. Even Jesus himself tells us in the Gospel of John, in the world, he says, you shall have tribulation. He says that in the Gospel of John. In the world, you shall have tribulation. And then you would think that, you know, our response to that is, 
<sighs> but immediately after Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation. Then he said, Be a good cheer. Say, Cheer up. In the world you shall have tri tribulation. Do you know when you read it in the Greek, sometimes the Greek put the other way around. Because in the Greek, you could, you could put it either towards the end or to the beginning. But it has the same meaning and impact. So you could also read it as Jesus saying, Be of good cheer! In the world, you shall have tribulation. So the cheer and the tribulation come in the same breath. Say, oh, cannot be, cannot be. You know, Jesus is not consistent. Oh, he's very consistent. Not only in the Gospel of John, you read about it in the Gospel of Luke. In, that one is in chapter 6. He says, oh, they will revile you, they will persecute you, they will say things to you, they will oppose you, do all those things. And then he says, live for joy. You know, in Luke 6, you think after he has spoken all those things, and then you're already half dead. They persecuted you, slandered you, you know, tortured you, then all those things, you're already half dead. He says, live for joy. Say, oh Lord, what are you expecting of me? Now you're going to leap for joy. Because he says, your reward in heaven is great. And the revelation of the book of Philippians is this. That, that there is a type of grace. There is a measure of grace that comes into our life through the cross. And we cannot avoid the cross in Christianity. If you take away the cross out of Christianity, you have taken Everything that Jesus came to bring. Christianity without the cross is a cult. Christianity without the cross will have no resurrection. There is no resurrection because there is no cross. Christianity without the cross is false Christianity. Christianity without the cross is an apostasy. We have fallen away from the true church. Christianity without the sufferings of Jesus Christ is not Christianity anymore. It might be Christianity in name because he inherited a name. But it's no more the Christianity of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What he came to bring. And in our modern church, our modern era, especially in our modern church, we need to measure that. Have we taken the cross out of Christianity. Well, let me give you some scriptures on the cross to establish the fact that you really want to follow Jesus. If you really love Jesus, and today we come and we worship Jesus, we love Jesus, we sing songs to Him, we sing about Him, we sing to Him, we say we love Him. We all say we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, not just a believer. We want to be followers of Jesus Christ, practices of all that He teach, of His commandments and everything, not just you know a concept in our mind. We really want to follow him. Well, if you and I really want to follow him, he says, there must be the cross. Because no one can be the disciple of Jesus without knowing the meaning of the cross. Way back in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 38, when he had a lot of disciples coming to him, and, and all this is found in all the Gospels, but I just like to base what we say based on the Scriptures. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, it says, And he who does not take his cross, don't forget, this is a personalized cross. Personalized grace, personalized cross. Jesus is not talking his cross. He's talking about our personal cross when you follow Him. What Paul meant by, He has graced us with the privilege of believing in Him and also to suffer, to take up His cross. Jesus says in verse 38, He who does not take His cross and follow Me is not worthy of Me. He who finds His life will lose it. He who loses His life for My sake will find it. We ask you the question, when Jesus comes, we spoke about His coming just now, reading from Thessalonians. Will He find us worthy? Worthiness is based on whether we have been through the road of the cross. Matthew 16. 
after Jesus has, uh, Peter has confronted Jesus, Jesus makes this statement in Matthew chapter 16. Now these are mentioned in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, so we just pick some of them here to read. Verse 24 to 27. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in glory, the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. You want eternal glory? The cross is the way that Jesus plans it. Very quickly, we just look at Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Just lay a foundational understanding. Jesus says, now remembering that he had called his people to himself, his disciples, he says in verse 34, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. And then two chapters later, there was a rich man who comes to Jesus and he inquired, and say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, we all know the story of the rich man. But what many people did not do is read on to what Jesus said to him. That's found in Gospel of Mark chapter 10. Jesus and the rich young man. And the rich young man says in verse 17, What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And in verse 21, Jesus loved him. Jesus says, One thing you lack. He had the grace of God. I'm sure it must be the grace of God to keep the commandments. Because to a certain extent, he has been quite a righteous person. Or upright, if you want to use the word upright. Because Jesus, uh, he, Jesus turned the question to him, you know, you know the commandments, do not do this, do not do that, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said in verse 20, I have done all these things. In fact, that's why God was blessing him. When you live righteously, God bless you. But there's one more thing he lacked. Now a lot of people tap on the grace of God. And they have grace, they have favour, they have certain things. The grace of God has been with us, otherwise we all would have perished long, long ago. But would Jesus say the same thing to us as he said to the young man? One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. But look at the last part, people never emphasize. And come, he didn't just say come and follow me. He says come, take up the cross. Take up the cross and follow me. So there is a cross. Anyone who tries to deny there's a cross in Christianity is actually downgrading the quality of our faith and of all that Jesus came to bring. One last section on this in Luke 9 verse 23. It says here, He said to them again, if I read this because it adds a little flavor. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And here they add the word daily. See the word daily is added. Or rather it was there but Luke remembers it uh, through his conversation with the disciples and recorded it. 
take up his cross daily and follow me. Do you notice that the word follow Jesus comes only after the cross? It didn't say, you know, it didn't say follow me, then there's a cross. He says, take up the cross, then follow me. You cannot get through the cross, you cannot really follow him. Because to follow him, it is the pathway of the cross. That brings us to the big question. What is the cross? Four things. The cross in Jesus, four things. The cross, we examine what Jesus went through at the cross. Four things. Number one, he suffered. He suffered. I believe his suffering started from the day one when he landed on earth. And of course, all through his ministry. And then it got compressed together at Gethsemane and compressed together at the cross where he ultimately sacrificed his life for us. Suffering. Jesus suffered. Number two, he died. There is a death on the cross. There is a dying to self. Jesus died to self. At Gethsemane, he took the cup and says, If it be possible, take this cup from me. But he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he Gave himself. He says, no man take his life, but he lay down his life. The devil could not force him. Man could not have taken him. He freely gave his life to die for us. The cross involves death. That is why people don't like the cross. It means that we have to die to self. Number three, when Jesus was hanging on the cross in the process of dying, he said many things, but I believe one of the significant things he said, when he was at the cross crucified, all these people were mocking him, jeering him. And they said, come down here if, you're a son of God and all kinds of things. They don't realize he did have the power. He could have escaped that. But he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they have done. For they know not what they do. The cross must involve, number three, forgiveness. Many people can die, but they could die in anger. They could die in helplessness. But the cross involves something else. You die not crying for vengeance. You die not crying for revenge. You die not crying eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Because there are Old Testament people who do sacrifice their life who are very brave. And in the natural world, there are people who are brave enough to sacrifice their life maybe for uh, another person, a mother for a child, for example, or soldiers for the country. They sacrifice their life for a cause, for a purpose. For their loved ones. But the sacrifice is not enough. In the midst of the sacrifice, the words and the release of forgiveness must come forth. You know, it's, it's different. Like in the movies, and you see this fighting movie, they fight, 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 fight. And then, you know, the elder brother died or somebody, and they die. You know, take his blood and put it on the person. Remember, avenge my death. <laughs> And then the other guy in the family is not going to avenge his death. So there's no end. So let's say succeed and go to the other enemy. 
kill the other person. Let's say the, the, the Avenger succeeded. And then the other person also died. Goes to his next generation with the blood spilling out of him. Japanese movie. Ooh, lots of it. <laughs> Gory movie. And says, Avenge my death. <laughs> and then this person goes and kills the other side. No end. Generation after generation. That is set. dying is still not enough. I know I realize dying is a fantastic sacrifice. But the cross involves dying and you release forgiveness. Like Jesus. So in the death, it's the finale. It says no more. Let this be the end. So let's say that 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 situation, like an old Chinese movie, that enemy, like say the what is this, uh, trickiness or whatever. Let's say the Sung on that side, kill the Tang on this side. And then the Tang on this side, rise up, kill the Sung on the other side. Then on the other side, the Sung, next generation, rise up, kill the other side, the Tang. You know, it can go on for a few thousand years. You know when it will end? Only when the last person who die, because they all keep killing each other, they all die. In Chinese movie, always dying one. The hero always dying. And so the person is dying, says, Okay, this is the end. Release forgiveness. Then only there's a finale. So, in the true cross of sacrificing one's life, it must be this is it. Forgiveness is release. Third thing that involves in the true cross in suffering. Fourth is a resurrection. Only when that happened, we see what we call the resurrection power coming out. And that's when we see God's hand involved. Suffering, dying, forgiveness, and resurrection. In all the preaching of the apostles in the book of Acts, it always centered around the cross and the resurrection. Always, from the time of Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, and you check all the sermons of Paul, always they centered the cross and the resurrection. And there is no resurrection unless there is the cross. And that's the message that Paul was bringing forth in the book of Philippians in telling us that there is the cross in Christianity. And that cross involves four things we must be willing to do. Paul says it is our privilege in Philippians chapter, chapter 1, verse 29, to suffer. We must be willing to suffer. And that is not something that comes naturally. It comes supernaturally through God gracing us. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, he says, It has been granted. You and I have been given the grace to suffer. Not only to believe, we have been graced on behalf of Christ. Not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer. To take it on so that we can be truly like Jesus. If we have never experienced what Jesus went through at the cross, nor understand what it is to mean to give our life for another life, to live our life not for ourselves, but for another person, for another love, for those whom we love, to give ourselves away. We do not know what true Christianity is. And Paul even went as far as to say this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And that's a long one all about the cross. But let's look at it at this time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he actually began with the cross. He says in Philippians 
Oh, uh, that is Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17 onwards. Christ, he says, did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom or words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. See how important the cross was to Paul? He says, he is sent out, he is going out to talk about the gospel. And the gospel involves a willingness when we are converted, a willingness to suffer for Jesus. And he says his preaching was not with wisdom of words, not with great oratory, but he says, if that is done, the cross of Jesus will have no power. Then he went on. In fact, the whole chapter is about this cross message he has. Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. See, that's why you need to Christianity. People who don't understand the cross and the message of the cross and the, the reason why we need to suffer and take on the sufferings for on behalf of others. Now, we all suffer consequences of our acts and action. That is not the cross yet. Those acts and actions that we do, we suffer consequences, that is just justice. You read what you saw. The cross is when we take on the sufferings of another. Jesus didn't have to go to the cross to die. He did it for us. Paul didn't have to go and suffer. Paul was an intelligent man, well-trained man, top trained by Gamaliel. He could have lived a good life. He could have lived a rich life. Don't forget, he most likely is a member of the Sanhedrin Council. Sanhedrin Council is like being in the elite group in Israel. Lots of money, lots of power, lots of fame. Paul could have a good life. But he chose to give all those things up to preach the gospel. That is the cross. And you know how tough it was for him and what he suffered to preach the gospel? You find in the book of 2 Corinthians a whole list of what he went through. We all might know the least, but hold your place in 1 Corinthians 1. We'll come back to that in a short while. And you take a peep at some of the things he mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter. Looking at 2 Corinthians here, chapter 11, verse 24. From the Jews, five times I received 40 strikes. Minus one. Now when he was a Sanhedrin member, a rich man, an influential man, a powerful man, cloth with nice clothing, he never suffered this. The moment he followed Jesus, he was an outcast. Five times, He was beaten with 39 stripes. 5 times 40, so about 200. 200 minus 5. That's 195 strikes on the back with a rod. Anyone here have been beaten one time for Jesus? With sticks? None. I also haven't. So don't feel so guilty. Right. Maybe in the church we need to have one section. Oh, you, you know, here's a place, you know, Eddie might be able to operate the department <laughs> to get your rod, you know. Okay. You know? For Jesus. <laughs> no, no, I'm just teasing you. We haven't suffered physically like Paul. Now we might say, oh, you know, that's suffering. You know, we, we read through it. In fact, you can read uh, verse 24 to verse 28 in a few minutes 
But those things don't last a few minutes. Those things don't last a few minutes. They last a lifetime. 195 times he was beaten with a rod. One time he was stoned. Let me tell you, you stoned one time, he's dead. And we know when that one time was. Uh, Acts chapter 14. And he possibly had a heavenly experience at that time. Because after he was stoned, everybody thought he died. He might actually have died and come back. They dragged his body out and chuck it. Because they might thought he died. One time he was stoned. Anybody here have been stoned? Right. Now some of you, you know, maybe some pebble accidentally fall on your head. Right? But Paul actually had stones thrown at him. That's why it is said of the Apostle Paul. They said before he was stoned, according to Christian you know, literature, Paul was not really a handsome man. He was short, stout, and ugly. Sorry, Paul. You must be glorious now. You know, they overhear our conversation all the time in heaven. Sorry about that, Paul. It's illustrating. <laughs> but according to Chester, he, he, he was not a handsome. He was short. He was stout. He was ugly. I know some of you now say, Hallelujah, I got hope now. <laughs> not talking about you. And... Can you imagine if that was what he was before he was stoned? After he was stoned, uglier still. Has anyone entered the beauty contest after the stones have hit all over their face? <laughs> no. I can tell you, your, the destruction of your face is greater even than you know, a million pimples on your face. No way. Paul went through all those things. Three times he shipwrecked, soaked in the sea, a night and a day in the deep, and then all these other things he had told, he hunger. Now you ask me, why did he go through all those things? If you read 2 Corinthians, you know the reason why he did all those things, and you read about all those things that he went through, for one reason, he says, because he had great love. He says, the love of God constrained him to preach the gospel. The love of God was motivating him. He said, how can a person do all those things? The grace of God. Now we read about his life in the Bible and Paul has all the heavenly reward. Rewards which money cannot buy. And that's what the grace of God enables to. See, the whole purpose of grace and the cross. Let's look back at 1 Corinthians 1 and finish this off. He says, and then he challenged the Corinthians. When he talked about the cross, he says in verse 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And then he says in verse 26, You see your calling, brethren, he says, Not many wise according to the flesh, Not many mighty, Not many noble are called. But even if they were wise, Even if they were mighty or rich, Even if they are noble, he says, In verse 27, God had chosen the foolish things in the world To confound the wise. In other words, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1. Verse 1 and 2, chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I come to you, did not come with excellence of speech, or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He says, Paul says, I'm only interested in one thing when Christians gather together. Not how rich you are, not how powerful you are, not how clever you are, not how wise you are. He's only interested in whether you are 
a disciple of Christ and one who knows the cross of Christ. He says, not just Christ, Christ crucified. Whether you know the truth of what Christianity means. To be a disciple of Jesus is to take up the cross. No one can be his disciple unless you take up the cross. That separates disciples from just believers. Disciples take up the cross and follow him. The multitudes, they just follow from afar. And to his disciples, Jesus command to love one another as he loves us. Because when you love, there is a sacrifice. There is a sacrifice. When parents love their children, they are willing to sacrifice for their children. When a mother loves a child, the mother is willing to sacrifice for the child. I remember one time reading how in an earthquake and buildings had collapsed and a lot of people were trapped underneath the debris. And one newspaper report about how one mother with a child was there, trapped. And the child needs food. And they were many days inside. The mother bite and could move a little bit, but, but just a little bit, bite her own uh, body so that when the blood flow, she fed the blood to the child. As she died, the child lives. That's a mother's love. When you love, there is a sacrifice. When you love Jesus, you're willing to sacrifice for Him. When you love God, you're willing to sacrifice for God. That's what Paul talks about when he says, the cross. And he knew what he was talking about. Five times, 40 strikes minus one was put on his back. And those were not ordinary rods. His back was black and blue. We know of one time when that took place in the book of Acts chapter 16. When he went preaching in Philippi, cast out a, a demon from a girl. And immediately, they were taken and they were beaten and they were locked in prison. But in prison, because they know they, they did what they did because they love Jesus. They went out preaching because they love Jesus. They went out reaching to people because they love Jesus. So even when their back was painful, even though their feet was locked in chains, it says in Acts 16, at midnight, a time when most people will be so tired, they just want to rest and sleep. At midnight, they sang hymns and worshipped God. That is the power of the grace of God. If you have never experienced this measure of grace, then you will not experience the other part. You must experience suffering, dying to self, and forgiveness to experience the last one. Resurrection power. Resurrection power. Because at midnight when Paul and Silas were worshipping and singing and all the prisoners heard them, the Bible says, a great earthquake came. Do you know why the earthquake came? When you have been through suffering, and they never complain. When you have been dying to self for the sake of Christ. When all those suffering and dying didn't make you bitter. You see, that's the difference. A lot of people suffer out there in the world. A lot of people die out there in the world. You even read about it in the book of Revelation. But they are bitter. 
They suffer, but they became bitter. Lie, the suffering of life made them bitter. Angry, upset. That's not the suffering of Christ. When the grace of God, that's why we need grace to suffer. So the next time you have an opportunity, a God created situation where suffering occurs, we pray God that it won't be something too terrible. But even if it's too terrible, God will give you the grace of God. I mean, in terms of Christian persecution physically. We thank God in our modern world, there's less and less of that. But there are many other types of suffering for Christ. You can be slandered. Wrong things spoken about you. We have that all our life. It's still going on. People know exactly the right words to twist. In order to paint a picture of you so horrible that everyone who hears it will believe it. But you knowing God, it's not true. You knowing God, that wherever the source of it, if face to face comes to you, you could verify it is not true. Then you know this is suffering. This is real suffering. But some of us suffer, but then this is, this is the thing. Suffering is not enough. Dying is not enough. Yeah, I know, these things kill us. Oh, yes, a lot of people get killed outside. You know, the misery of life kills them. It must not produce one drop of bitterness. It must only produce through the grace of God love and out of your life flows love and sometimes people ask Lord why is this world like that why oh why long ago somebody did a wonderful play and uh, I heard about that play once and the person showed in that play beautifully all the misery of the human life all the sufferings the heartache all that we can ever think about all the horrible evil man does of the man and and circumstances things that happen the devil and all those things the greatest evil and at the end of the play everything was stripped away and there's just one person who reached out to God and said why oh Lord why and then the scene changed to show just the cross and Jesus there on the cross because only in suffering can you tell great love how do you know God loves you? how greatly do you know that Christ loves you? Just because God say it? No. Because while we were yet sinners, He died for us. Think about it. How do you know somebody else loves you? Husband and wife, how do you know you love one another? Because you know not just you do good things to one another. That in spite of who you are, in spite of knowing all your weaknesses, in spite of knowing all your strengths and your weaknesses, in spite of knowing all your flaws, they still want to marry you and live with you. And then how do marriages last? Many marriages get broken up. Why? Because after they marry, all their flaws come out even more. You know, after they married, then they found. I read one, your Singapore, you know, stories. Where there were some people talking about, you know, their relationship in, the, in, in your papers. And after the marriage, this Singaporean girl who married one, I think, uh, European man, after the marriage, and they never realized it, after the marriage, they realized one can sleep in aircon, one cannot. 
too late already married. So when they moved to Singapore, because over overseas it was heater, so both don't know. And him, then he says, all through the night, the husband keep tossing and turning, cannot sleep. And then, brother, brother, you know, uh, all that cannot sleep because she cannot take aircon. But he needs aircon. Can't sleep in your weather. So he put out is a strange husband. <laughs> but after many times, then he realized they could not. So, you know, it was funny because it was your Singaporean story. In the end, their solution was very unique. I don't recommend it for all. So, after two, three weeks, husband, you know, blurry eye every morning, had to go to work. Impossible. So, what are they going to do? And so, their solution was funny. In the end, uh, they had separate rooms. At first, she tried mosquito net. You know. Open the door. You open the door, you no know, cool air, you know, no air con, because she cannot take air con. But in comes a mosquito. And they all love European blood. <laughs> and so they tried mosquito and everything in the end. They managed to steal, I think, when she wrote the article in your papers, they were about two, three years down the road in a marriage. So they must have solved their problem. So in the end, they had separate bedroom. One, no aircon, one aircon. So he had a good night's sleep, she had a good night's sleep. And then when it's on a cool, raining night, then they sleep in the same bedroom. <laughs> Funny solution. But their marriage still stay. Strange thing, you know. You never know. He, her, married. After marriage, you say, Well, oh, I don't know you use this part of the toothbrush which I hate. Why must you squeeze the toothpaste that way? Can't you squeeze it properly? All the little things come up and irritate you. And, but too late, you cannot divorce over toothpaste squeezing. <laughs> and they tell the court, court, I like squeezing the toothpaste slowly from the bottom. She squeezes it right. <laughs> so horrible, you know, like strangling someone. <laughs> you know? So all the little things come out. But in the end, if you love one another, you put up with that. You put up with that. I don't know what the solution for the toothpaste. Buy two different toothpaste. One can squeeze to all your heart's content. The other systematically roll it. There is a solution. But love finds a way. How do you know he or she loves you? Because in spite or despite everything, they still choose to be with you and love you. That's the, that's the love of God. If there was no suffering and test of the love, how would you know that someone really loves you? You actually don't know. You only know when someone really loves you in a difficult time. In a difficult situation, in a painful situation. And you all read about you all read about how one South American plane landed on some mountain somewhere where it's filled with ice and then they took a long time because no one knew they were lost there. And uh, then they survive. Finally, some of them survive. Other people died. And then some of them survive. There's no food. So they eat the, f the other people who died. <laughs> Horrible story to tell at this time when you're about to have dinner in a while. And uh, it's this uh, losing its thing, then we better change. Yeah. And uh, so it's a. Uh, and so then that story has gone around the world. I'm sure you might have heard of that story. And it's so horrible. Thank you. It's so. That's. that's it's so horrible that. Uh, you think of people eating one another. But as one by one died, 
this was the thing. And in fact, I used that in one of the Bible study situations. Say, wow, Bible study over that story, yes. And this was the question that I passed around and asked. If you die, would you like somebody to eat you? <laughs> and then the other question is, would you eat somebody else? <laughs> and of course, they ask me the same question. I don't know whether I can get past that. I might rather die. <laughs> but then I, I would say, if there's no food and you're one of those people there, I would tell them I won't be offended if I die and I'm the only food, eat me up. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, I don't know whether from today onwards you start thinking about your relationship with one another and you look at your wife and say, if I die, will you eat me? <laughs> no, you don't have to. But it's a strange situation to be in. But then you think about your willingness to give your life to somebody else. Love, true love involves sacrifice, inconvenience. And the reason why we came to the planet Earth is to learn about love. And this is the answer to the reason why there's suffering, inconvenience, tests, trials, is this. Without those things, you can't tell whether someone loves. Like you came to learn about patience, then obviously there will be situations that could be created that you need lots of patience to learn patience. If you came to a situation where you got to learn about faith, there will be a situation where you will be put in the uh, circumstances where you really need to go by your faith rather than by what you feel. If we came to this earth to grow in love, to learn about the love of God, there will be situations where we are tested to learn about love. And the sufferings are involved then. And the, this is the reward of the grace of God. When they still continue worshipping God, not one drop of bitterness was in their life, but, but when, when love keeps flowing to you, remember, any time when you find it hard to love somebody, any time when you could choose between bitterness and love, we will always have that, con that choice all the time. And, and even with tears and struggle, you choose love. And when every time you choose love, some part of you win. Something of you got transformed. And guess what? You will taste the power of God. Paul chose the love of God through all his suffering. Silas chose that and they sang hymns and praise. They saw the power of God come. Instantly their chains were broken. Prison doors were opened. A revival broke forth. God's power comes at the end of the cross. Now there is sufficient grace to have to take the cross, take the suffering, take the love of God, go to the cross. But the greatest is after the cross. The resurrection power of Jesus. That's what Paul was bringing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, I, brethren, when I come in verse 1, come to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. This is Paul speaking. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. But, and here comes the good part. Here's where the resurrection comes. In demonstration of the Spirit and of power. 
that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And that's what Paul was bringing forth in Philippians when he talked about the grace of God. You see, he didn't end with the fact in Philippians 1 verse 29 that it is that we are grace not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer. Because in Philippians chapter 2, he showed us, look at Christ. Look at what he has suffered. Look at all that he has gone through. Look at how much love he has. And then he says, look at how greatly God has graced him and exalted him. Because God gave grace to the humble. And there is two sides of grace. There is a suffering side with great love that God gives you the energy to endure. And when you finish, there is the glory side, the power side that we will see. Unfortunately, many people see that side but didn't allow that part of the grace to work fully in them, which is why we need this teaching. Because when you understand, no one ever endured the cross without a resurrection. No one ever suffered in love without getting a reward. No one is denied the power, the glory of God. Never, God forbid. It is against the very nature of the law of God. That should anyone ever in love die for others, in love suffer for others, in love forgive in the midst of their pressure and suffering. It is the law of God that the glory must and will come. It shall not be denied. Which I close with the book of First Peter. We talk about the glory and the presence of God. And in 1 Peter, Peter encouraged them about suffering for Jesus. In verse, chapter 4, verse 12. The same Peter who later on in chapter 5 talked about God receives the proud and gives grace to the humble. He says in verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing has happened. And this, we're trying to communicate. Do not think it strange that sometimes you have to endure suffering. You have to suffer for righteousness. You have to suffer because you love. You have to suffer and die like Jesus on the cross for others. It is not strange. It is not unthinkable. It is normal if you're a disciple of Jesus, a disciple of God, to take up the cross. And he says in verse 13, but rejoice, 1 Peter 4, 13, to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Again, partakers of the grace of God. Partakers of Paul of his suffering. You partake of Christ's suffering. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. <coughs> and I'll tell you why all these things are there. The grace of the cross. You get a twofold reward. You are rewarded in heaven and you are rewarded on earth. Twofold reward. On earth, God bring His glory to you. In heaven, your reward is great. Your reward is great. <coughs> he says that's the reason why we should live and joy. Live for joy in Luke chapter 6. Because our reward is great. Twofold reward. Not just earthly reward. Heavenly reward and earthly reward. 
in First Peter 4, it says, verse 14, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. God wants to bring his glory to the church. Talk about the glorious church. But the beginnings of glory are the cross. And as you go to the cross and enter cheerfully, lovingly, we will see His glory. What does His glory cover? His power. The power side of His grace. Deliverance. Provision. All the wonderful side of the grace on this side. And many people don't see this side because they've never gone through that side. Be patient. Be patient. Patiently endure. Patiently wait. I know. Jesus knows. The cross is not easy. When you go to the cross... Every human part of you wants to fight. Every human part of you wants to cry justice. Every human part of you wants to cry revenge. And you say, can really a human being do that? No. But a born again disciple of Jesus can. No ordinary human can do that because humans will eye for eye, two for two. Say, are there any disciples? Lots of them. Even in book of Acts, you have some. You remember Stephen? They took stones and they're stoning him. And when he was dying, he didn't cry out for revenge. He said, Lord, lay not this charge on them. Because of that one cry, God began to release a powerful work. And I believe because of that one cry, Saul was targeted to be saved. If he cried revenge, God helped those people. But he cried forgiveness. Like Jesus, Father forgive them for they know not what they have done. Stephen cried forgiveness. The Bible says the blood of Abel cried for vengeance. That's Old Testament. If our blood is shed, let our blood cry forgiveness. Then we will see the power of God. And since Stephen's time, until the time when they recorded the book called Fox's Book of Martyr, Fox Book of Martyrs, where it record hundreds and thousands of Christians who gave their life for the gospel. They died because they love Jesus. They suffered because they love Jesus. Some of them under threat of animals and, and, and lions and all that, in the Roman time, under threat of sword and death, would not deny Jesus. If you want to know whether that can be done, read Fox Book of Martyrs. You read some of them, and if you really are human, you will be touched. Because among some of them, it record how some of them, when they were persecuted, and one, I remember one vividly they recorded how he, as he died, and they said, deny Jesus, he says no. And they lifted, he lifted out his hand to worship God. They chopped off his hand. He lifted the other hand to worship God. They chopped off his hand. They cut his legs. 
and he still raised his head to worship God and forgive them and they cut off his head. Every breath says forgiveness and love. It's not humanly possible. That is why the Bible says the grace of God can give you the ability. I know people have claimed grace of God for prosperity. Claim the grace of God for favor. But have you ever thought of claiming the grace of God to suffer? So the next time, you cannot take it anymore. The pressure is too much. Hey, wait a minute. There is the grace of God for suffering. You forgot to ask. That's why all run out. Reach out to God and say, God, Give me more grace. And you will find the supernatural grace of God come into your life. When something in you rise up beyond your own ability, not yourself, and you can say, Father, forgive. And when you could do that, a power of glory, the spirit of glory is released that has never been seen before. That's the message of Philippians. The grace of God to suffer, to endure in order to see the glory of God. Christians have not been taught about the cross. You know, you be frightened, the Christian. Take up your cross, take up your cross, die daily. Well, they're all frightened. They're all frightened to die. But we forgot to tell them God give you the strength to do that. God actually give you the grace. And you say, what will the grace do to me? Like what he did to the disciples. You know what they did? As I say, Acts 16, when they beat them up, they can still sing song. They sang song. And I believe it was Cho yong who had one of the visions of heaven and he met Stephen. You know Stephen who died in the Bible? He says, Stephen, how was it when you died? And he says, I didn't feel any pain. So some of you thought, you know, yes, with, with, without the grace of God, very painful death. You know, every stone, ayah, ayah, ayo, ayo, and then you die with your last ayo, no time to pray forgiveness. But the grace of God on your life fills you. No pain. So you could still pray. Lay not this judge on them. Here you go. Not a single ayo, ayah, ah, ooh, ah. The grace of God. No pain. Look at the book of Acts when they beat them up when they preached the gospel. They said they went rejoicing. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy to be beaten. Something strange, something powerful. The grace of God strengthens you. So that in spite of everything, you feel the joy of the Lord. The joy is so great. The same grace that Paul says in the book of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Remember what he says that Satan, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him. You remember that? Buffet. Now, buffet, same spelling. It's not buffet. Eat him up. Although we talk about eating people. Buffet means constantly punching Right? That's buffeting a person. Constantly punching. And Paul must be feeling, and, and for him, he must have felt all those things. And he cried three times to God. Take this away. Silence in heaven. Take this away. Silence in heaven. The time he said, Lord. And then the answer came. My grace is sufficient for you. God says, I've given you something. An ability to take it. An ability to suffer. And as I mentioned, it won't end there. It will end in resurrection, glory. Reward in heaven, reward on earth. But the, the hardest thing is not the reward. Reward is easy. It's getting there. And that's where Philippians tells us we can receive the grace of God. When Paul received the grace of God, you know he's turning around. He says, 
I take pleasure. 2 Corinthians 12. That's the grace of God. He says, by the grace of God. He says, His weakness is now His strength. And He says, where He is weak, when I'm weak, then I am strong. But the best part is the word, I take pleasure. So when the devil was buffeting, he go boom. He says, oh, nice. I take pleasure. Another one. Boom. Ah, nice. You know, it's no more ayo. He say, ah, I take pleasure. Can you imagine? And that's the secret. Why is it that people cannot suffer for Christ? Why is it they're frightened of the cross? Because it doesn't look like pleasure. It looks terrible. Oh, but there is a joy that is deeper than natural happiness. There is a joy and a peace that is in the spirit so strong, that is so overpowering, that you literally don't feel any suffering. So to you, when the grace of God is there, the, everyone looks is suffering. I mean, Stephen died and Cho Yung went there and met him. Stephen said, he didn't feel any pain. Now when you don't feel any pain as the stones are coming, that's not bad, isn't it? Here comes a stone, you could even smile for the camera. <laughs> as the stones are coming to you, the grace of God. Praise God. So the next time, if you're suffering, injustice, suffering for situations, suffering for slander, suffering for anything, you know, all those things that happen in life, which, by the way, everyone outside also suffer who don't know Christ. Correct? It's all out in the world, everywhere, human society, anywhere. But there's a difference. The message in the church is this. There is such a thing as the grace of God to suffer. Outside, they don't have. You know what they have to turn to? Psychology, counselor, help me, you know, counsel me, uh, you know. And then they go for you know, all kinds of things. It doesn't help. Because, you know, after they share everything with the psychologist, then the psychologist don't know who to share to, commit suicide. <laughs> suicide rate very high. The psychoanalyze you and they don't know solution. So the world don't know where to turn to. And it, don't you agree? Not only do we need finances in this life, not only do we need uh, the favor of God in this life, not only we, do we need all the blessings of God to provide for all our needs, not only we, do we need all the healings and all the wonderful things God do, can do, we need to know the grace of God to endure such things that will happen out on the, in the world. It will happen to you when you encounter non-Christians who persecute you misunderstand you. It might happen to you when Christians don't understand one another. It will happen anytime. But the difference is that there is a message that there is a supernatural ability, a supernatural gift of God, a supernatural grace of God to be able to turn all those things into a pleasurable experience. So some of you are saying, wow, I want some of it. All right, we're going to give it to you today. <laughs> it will turn you. Now, think about it. If God remove all this pain and all those bitterness and all those terrible things that, that eats you up, that cause suffering in the world, no matter what is caused by, is there anything left in life that will make you unhappy? Nothing. Suddenly, your whole life is full of happiness. When life is down, you're cheerful. When life is up, you're cheerful. When life is sideways, you're cheerful. When there's pain, you're cheerful. When there's pleasure, of course, you have pleasure upon pleasure. Look at it this way. This is an important message because it means that now, out in the world, you of course are not afraid when the blessing of God comes in terms of finances, healing, and all the good things that the world sees as good. But you are also not afraid when the bad things happen because you have the grace of God to take it, to face it, and to go through it victoriously. That's what the grace of God has come to do. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the grace of God. 
We thank you, Father God, that you have always said, it is not we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And we know when we take up the cross, we are saying, oh Lord, it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Father, we recognize none of us can actually take suffering on our own. It is not human to take suffering. It is not human to endure the way and the things Christ endured. But we thank you, Father. It is your grace. It is the higher spiritual law. When the things of life challenges us, when whatever comes into our life causes pain, causes hardship, causes difficulty, when we feel, oh God, the bitterness of life, we now know we can come to you and have you turn our bitterness into sweetness. You did say in your word, That you turn our ashes into joy. You put, take off the garments of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. You bring beauty out of ashes. You brought grace into suffering. You brought glory into suffering. What a wonderful gospel we have received. It makes us brave people in you. Brave because we can now face things we cannot face before. Brave because we are more enabled to do things that we never thought we could do. And all of it by your strength. We are so God that even as we ponder upon your word to us, the grace of God for the cross of Christ. We know, Lord, that this life is a short life. But a life to be lived to the fullest for you. And we all want a life full of glory. The glory of God. We ask, oh God, that you take us from the place where we are today into higher ground. That we will find, oh God, the place where you want us to be. Thank you, Father. And even we thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our cry because of the name of Jesus. Thank you for hearing when we lack strength, you are our strength. When our faith is weak, you are the author and finisher of our faith. When we find that we don't seem to be able to endure, your grace is there to help us endure. Thank you, Father. presence of the Lord is here. Doesn't matter what you're facing in this life. And I sense that a particular loved one had just received news about another one, of someone you're praying for. And that they didn't have good news, but that they're facing a situation where a particular ailment or sickness has come upon them, someone you know someone you love and that they might not live through it the Lord is able to give you the grace to turn things around in whatever situation you're facing in your heart and in your life I know all of us have the cross in our life all the time but you are here today and you're in a situation where like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Now where to turn to? 
the grace of God will bring you through. There's no situation on earth known to any human or unknown to human that God cannot put the grace of God to endure and to victoriously break through. The grace of God is there. Some things do take time. But all things are possible to God. Only believe. Perhaps you're at a point where you're wanting to give up. The Lord says, you can give up. But if you know the grace of God in you, the grace of God in you will never give up. And you do not lack of anything except one thing you lack. The grace of God that comes to the cross of Christ. It's here for you. So let's all stand and let's sing that song. The old rugged cross. Let's try it in C first. I am not sure the key. And that old rugged cross, so despised by the world. Yet it's a central theme of Christianity that we never can let go. It may be old, it may be rugged. Not only was it the cross of Christ, it's your cross and my cross. To bear for the spirit of glory on earth and for heavenly reward. Heavenly reward that God will give to us. On a hill far away stood an no rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of love sinners was laid so I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last are laid down Cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. If you need prayer, we'll pray for you, but we we'll continue singing. Oh, the old rugged cross. So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Love is glory above To Cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will claim.
Jesus Christ the Lord bless you with supernatural strength and grace to endure all the tough times of life the hard times the difficult times because in the end all things pass away mountains do pass and become humble and level Valleys do become filled. Rough ways do become smooth. The grace of the Lord upon your life that He released upon you this day will give you the strength to endure, to pursue, and to enter into the joy of the Lord. For behold, save the Lord, His reward for you is great. And your eternal rewards are even more glorious. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace, favor, and grace. In Jesus' name, Amen. The Lord be with you. God bless you.